so in this season one, uh, we're actually going to do an overview in this video. And this is going to be season one of migrating to Oak 365 from SharePoint 2007, 2010, and 2013. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see what the season looks like. Um, hold on, let me switch this presenter view here. Okay, so we're ready to rock and roll. So basically what we want to cover, uh, the first thing we want to do in episode one, we're going to cover the uh, modern sites. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of goodness here in these modern team sites, O365 uh, group sites, and then also the modern pages. Because if you're migrating from 07 to 2010 to 2013, all out into O365, it's going to be the modern pages that's going to bring those legacy sites up to the, digi the new digital era and some of the new modern features that are built out of the box when you're creating a new O365 modern site or if you're uh, incorporating a Microsoft Teams site from a UI perspective. Uh, these modern sites in the UI is a little bit different. Uh, one, they're mobile friendly, so they're going to be a lot lighter. Uh, they're going to be responsive, uh, and I think they're going to be more Java-based versus um, .NET component and .NET script-based for all my uh, SharePoint developer techies out there. Uh, so we're going we're going to go into uh, some of the um, highlight some of the features in episode one on how you uh, you see uh, the difference between them. And it seems as if, and, I'm, and we have to confirm this though, but it seems as if there's a certain uh, setting or a certain uh, state that your legacy sites must be in in order to take advantage of the modern site pages. But when we go through this episode, we'll confirm that. In episode two, we're gonna take a look at the modern list of modern document libraries. Again, this is gonna be very similar to what you have all the way back in 07, uh, where you know the lists are the same, the concept of the lists are the same, the concept of document libraries are the same. Uh, you still have the capabilities of creating views, creating site columns, uh, binding them to content types, all this other good stuff. Uh, I think the the major piece is going to be the UI. The UI design is a little bit different. There are some new features there uh, as far as like copying, moving files. That's a much easier out of the box with the UI. You don't need third-party uh, components or buttons within, within the ribbon in order to move documents uh, between uh, folders within the same library. And I think, and I believe by the time we film this, um, uh, they, they should have the capability of moving uh, documents between uh, different libraries within the site or even libraries within a different site or site collection. That feature may actually be there by the time that we film this, but we'll see. Uh, in episode three, we're going to talk about the SharePoint Home. From a strategy standpoint, you really want to be familiar with the SharePoint Home because I think that will help you with your navigation story. Uh, obviously, you know, or in Prem, we try to leverage the global navigation as the glue uh, as users na navigate between uh, different sites within the site collection or even sites across uh, various site collections, uh, which was a pain in the butt, right? Because you end up having to customize that global navigation and centralize it in a certain spot to where, you know, the massive pages that were leveraging that global navigation across site collections will be able to. Um, have it consistent and you didn't have to do something silly like uh, duplicate that global navigation across those site collections. But with the SharePoint Home, it really helps streamline that navigation story from an end user perspective, especially considering that depending on the, the user uh, and their line of work and the, and the sites that they touch and the sites they interact with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, may not be represented in that global navigation, right? So say for example, I'm part of project A, I'm part of department two, and I'm also part of committee Z. And you know, I'm frequently I'm frequent in those different sites on a daily basis. And in order to bounce between them, I have to either bookmark them or something of, of those sorts, only because uh, yes, the global navigation exists, but it's more generic. It's more for the majority of the information or the popular information within my organization, but not necessarily with with the two or three links that I frequent daily. So that way I had to rely on heavily on the Internet Explorer or Chrome or Firefox bookmarking um, in order to, to store those sites. Here with the SharePoint Home, uh, they have out of the box features to where one, every site that you frequent is bubbled to the top any site that you re, uh, that you follow, right, or bookmark within SharePoint, that's their following feature. Uh, those are categorized and booked for you. Uh, then also, it's going to highlight uh, other sites that you just have access to. Um, so I think it's a very convenient feature. So again, you want to complement that when you start looking at your navigation story. Uh, so that way you don't try, uh, you know, do what we had to do in 07 
2010 or 2013 and try to, you know, when we built out the information architecture, try to scrub and, you know, evaluate, evaluate, assess, evaluate what were the, some of the most popular. I think some of that pressure is kind of, it doesn't go away, but I think some of that pressure is kind of uh, relieved. For OneDrive, uh, this is this is a big one. Uh, this is the one that I think I think is shifting. Um, is this is what's replacing the my sites that we're used to in 07, 2010, 2013. Uh, part of that before when it was on like on prem, I believe they rebranded at one point in time from my sites to OneDrive for business. Uh, in 0365, you're still going to have that, uh, but I think they're shifting it from being though the DNA is a site collection. And, you know, as a user perspective, you can go out there and, and do things that you can do in the standard site collection as far as creating sub-sites, creating additional document libraries and lists and things along those lines. But I think Microsoft is moving away from that and going more so towards like a Google Drive type approach where there's a single library and all it is is carved up into multiple folders. Uh, but I think the story in OneDrive from Microsoft OneDrive is better than Google Drive in the sense that you can apply different metadata, right? You still have the ability to do site columns and views and all this other good stuff, which is from a user perspective, makes it a lot easier for me to organize my files, tag my files, and really try to highlight different things uh, in the file. But if you're a folder centric, and you're, you know, you're used to that game with creating multiple folders and deep folders to help categorize information and sort your information. You have that capability there. But I think the biggest feature for OneDrive is its uh, sync process. And this is the key or the glue that allows you to, uh, you know, start a document on your laptop grab your tablet or your mobile phone, run to a meeting, and still have access to that document. Or in a, in a meeting, you follow up OneNote, take notes, and then go back to your desk, and those notes are automatically synced with your OneNote uh, thick client application on your laptop. So I think the sync process is what really differentiates and make uh, OneDrive more uh, user-friendly and more mobile-friendly. And uh, flex, you know, just you know, mobile, not necessarily in device, but mobile as in the user who may have multiple devices. So we'll take a look at some of those cool features. Uh, with search, I think search, this is probably the one that uh, there's no major, major change, especially if you're coming from 2013. Uh, if you come from 07, 2010, it's more robust. Uh, it actually find things, uh, which um, before that was an issue. Um, you know, the full text search, you know, for office documents, naturally, it's going to be there. I believe for PDFs, they are there. Uh, so, you know, when you start looking at eye filters and, and different uh, filters that are needed for in-document type indexing, uh, that's going to be an interesting conversation. So if you're dealing with, like, CAD documents, for example, that are outside of uh, the office suite, um, it, it may be interesting to either see, you know, there may be some uh, fallout as far as like how deep you can go with that indexing and that type of search. But, you know, there, there's a, a few nuances there that we're going to uh, uh, jump into as far as like the scheduling for continuous crawl and full crawl. Uh, you don't have access to that, you know. So, you know, we're talking about the, de the technique that if you're dealing with uh, search solutions for all my developers out there, and you are creating managed properties and all this other good stuff, when to expect that managed property to be indexed and available for use uh, within search is going to be a very interesting story. But I think for the most part, especially for if, you, if you're familiar with 2013, this is going to be pretty much similar. I mean, you're going to have a global schema, right, that's going to be what we call an on-prem central admin, and here it's going to be the SharePoint admin Um there, um, you know, to where you can manage that stuff. Uh, the refiners, you know, the web parts and all this other stuff are still available. It's going to be interesting what they do because as of right now, there is no, uh, like, search result web part for the modern sites in the modern document library. So, you know, we have to take a look at that. But I think for the legacy stuff, uh, everything is going to be pretty much uh, feature, compare, and rich to what you used to in 2013. All right, so in Episode 6, we're going to talk about Dell. Uh, this is the their machine learning, right? Uh, this is going to be, it's, a, it's kind of a mix, right? The, part of the mix of the Delve is, remember your my, my site profile where you had like your profile image and then it had like all your user profile properties as far as like your department and your org and all this other good stuff? That's now part of Delve. That's one piece of it. The other piece of it is going to be um, the, the machine learning, right? It's, it's, what it tries to do is try to get smart and try to add machine that's, that's tracking your activity. Like, say, for example, if uh, I was part of your organization and you and I were communicating via email uh, and I'm working on a document that it found that, you know, that was uh, relevant or within context of that email without you searching for that document because, one, you don't know that document exists. 
but I, I opened it up to where it's shared to the team and you're part of that team AD or part of that team SharePoint group so you have access to it. This is going to appear in your Delve profile, like your Delve dashboard that says, oh, Deshaun, you may also may be interested in these documents. And that's a categorization, a categorization or a characteristic uh, to where my document kind of fits uh, within that mold. So it pushes documents to you based on what other team members are working on. It also pushes contacts and people to you based on other team members that people that you're interacting with uh, or high interaction with other people they're interacting with. So the Dell profile and the Graph API with machine learning is very interesting. Um, so you, when you compare Delve against Search, Search is where you go to pull information, like you go and you're looking for it, you're trying to find it, you're trying to pull it in, and Delve is more of a push where um, you don't know it, it exists, but it's trying to help you out and suggest certain certain things for you. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see this in real practice, right? Because ideally, the hope is is that when you are in a meeting and someone who the presenter is is presenting a PowerPoint or what have you, and then they share that out, you know, to a team or a group that you're a part of, so you have access to it. By the time you get to your desk or later that day, that PowerPoint just appears in your Delve profile because of that interaction, and say, hey, you might also may be interested in this. All right, so Stream and Video Hub, uh, this is going to be like the uh, O365 video solution for hosting videos, streaming videos, uh, right there in O365. Uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, a lot of organizations are using this more so like their training or presentation. It has a it has a YouTube feel to it uh, in a sense that you can create multiple channels to help group and categorize videos. Uh, you do have the ability to put metadata on the video so it makes them easy to categorize and, you know, um, put uh, characteristics around them to help group them. So even though they may be in multiple channels, but they share the same uh, site column and value, you can easily pull those together. Uh, there's an API that uh, that's tapped into it, so that way you can uh, do, build some very custom, uh, very cool custom uh, solutions with this, with the, the new modern um, web parts, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of different capabilities there. So, but, you know, you do have a uh, video hosting solution in, in O365. You do have uh, the ability to uh, stream information, uh, stream video within O365. So, you know, there's no need to do like a third-party component. So it's very useful. Uh, Microsoft Flow, this is a new guy. This is more of a workflow type solution. Um, it's not feature which rich in the sense where you can uh, replace like SharePoint workflow or Nintex workflow or K2 workflow, or any of those guys. It's not to that level yet, but they're, they're Microsoft is constantly and consistently adding new features and capabilities to it. So over time, I think it will be uh, at a level to where you can replace it. But from a strategy standpoint, when we're looking at Microsoft Flow and Power Apps, from a strategy standpoint, it's going to be more so where do these fit into the ecosystem? Where do these fit as far as like um, if you need a custom form solution, is it Power Apps? If you need a mobile app solution and it, and all it does is integrate with a list or, you know, maybe it integrates with a list and there's a workflow behind it or a flow behind it, you know, you know what does that type of solution look like before you crack open uh, the Visual Studio Code and start custom developing uh, one of these guys? So, um you know, and, you know, how does it compare to some of the third parties where I think, you know, the comparison is going to be wide uh, initially, but I think over time that gap is going to close. And then, you know, how do you position this to as your tier one or tier two or tier three type um, tool to satisfy certain business requirements and solutions? Microsoft Teams is going to be, this is a new one. Uh, I still haven't wrapped my head around uh, Microsoft Teams, but I know it's, it's definitely uh, another collaboration tool uh, for different teams and users. I think the characteristics of the business requirement or the characteristics of the business use case of when you will use a team versus an O365 group uh, versus a legacy team site uh, is going to be interesting. Um, I, I, I think the, the line is, I don't want to say the line is that fine, but I think the scenarios are, are different, are interesting. So, you know, we, we, what we'll do at minimum, we'll dive into Microsoft Team. Uh, we'll highlight some of the features. You know, we'll walk through a demo of that. Uh, but then, you know, I think it's really going to be up to the organization. And really, I think time will tell on where teams actually fit within the collaboration uh, suite of tools and kind of go from there. It may just be a preferences thing, right? It may be one of those things where certain teams will say, yeah, we like teams. Uh, this kind of fits our model or this kind of fits our scenario, what we're trying to solve, uh, because it's more communication-centric 
versus O365 groups, where it may be more file or document centric that says, you know, anytime we collaborate or anytime we talk, you know, we are discussing tasks or files or, you know, or, or things along those lines or list data or whatever the case may be. So it's, it's going to be interesting. And the last one uh, for this season is going to be, uh, for season one, it's going to be the Microsoft Planner. And basically this is where... Um, you kind of go and, and kind of map out like a roadmap and start building like high level plans uh, and getting the, the, the roadmap together or the, the, the board. Yeah, and that's the thing. They use a lot of different features and terminology to describe things. But basically all it is is especially like for me coming from like a JIRA uh, type environment for Agile. You know, obviously, you're going to have like your your major plan. Like, this is what we want to tackle. You put, you know, put those into like a backlog. There's a prioritization on how you want to, you know, which one of these you want to tackle first, or the MVP, most viable product, right? Which one of these should be first, second, third, and then based on when you have that epic, you want to chunk that out into different tasks or subtasks and things like that that would actually get worked on from a day to day. So I think Planner is one of those deals that. You kind of take that plan at a very high level, chunk it out that says, we don't have all the details, but these are the key components we want to tackle. Here's the priority, and now we want to chunk these out into smaller sizes. So it'll be interesting to see how this integrates with Microsoft Project Sites uh, and its tasks, you know, engine, um, and, and so on. But the cool thing about Microsoft Planner for Microsoft Teams and for O365 group sites uh, you actually do get a uh, planner option or feature that's baked in part of those sites. So, you know, you can you can easily navigate between, you know, planner and your group and keep everything well within context ex as well as explode it out. that says, OK, I'm part of these seven, five, you know, five to seven groups and I have two tasks here and three tasks there and four tasks and another one, you know, and you have a bird's eye view to see all your tasks as it relate to you. So, you know, I, I, we will take a look at planning. We'll take a look at some of these features. And then based off of that, you know, you'll be able to make an informed decision to really understand like what these tools are, how it fits in your strategy. Um, and then, you know, how you probably want to rethink how you know your different approaches based on your business requirement based on your use cases on how it was done in the past with some of their 07 2010 13 on prem compared to what you're going to do uh when you migrate out to 0365 okay so that's it uh for the season uh one overview so now uh in the next video we're going to get uh, get into the details of episode one